Good morning, everyone. Christopher Ricker here, New York City Parks Environmental Educator with the Greenbelt. And today I want to welcome you to our Greenbelt at Home virtual hike in Bloodroot Valley. I hope you are all enjoying your day and this beautiful sunny weather after that little bit of snowfall we had yesterday. So today we're going to be hiking with myself and Angel, our other environmental educator at the Greenbelt. And again, in the Bloodroot Valley section of the Greenbelt. So Bloodroot Valley became part of the Greenbelt in 1994 when the city of New York gave it to the Parks Department. And it helped to add to the 2,800 plus acres that we have today in the Greenbelt. Now, Bloodroot Valley has a very interesting name. Some people say it's kind of macabre-like and there's some intrigue and some mystery and maybe we'll see some of that as we're hiking. But this area of the Greenbelt got its name Bloodroot from a small plant that is found primarily in this section of Staten Island known as Bloodroot, which is a member of the poppy family. They're a spring plant, so they come out March, April, when some other spring plants are starting to come out as well. And they have these beautiful white flowers. Sometimes you can get seven to 12 flowers in a bundle of Bloodroot, but they don't last very long. They're very sensitive flowers. And so some harsh winds, some snow, some heavy rain can knock the petals off pretty quickly. But they're resilient species. They've been here for a really long time. And we're honored that we're able to name this part of the Greenbelt after such an amazing plant. So I actually see our other environmental educator, Angel. So I'm gonna flip around and let her say hello to all of you on this lovely morning. Hi everyone. Nice to see you. I'm standing here at the Con Edison Wayfinder, um, which is, I'm trying to find my way right now, actually, because I just came from Mount Moses. I parked at, near the bus stop on Rockland Avenue, where you can come from Mount Moses, take the yellow trail, and then there's a little footpath that if you look at the Greenbelt map, it's a black and white dotted path between the yellow trail and the blue trail. So we're on the blue trail right now, and this wayfinder is a really great way to find your way because it's one of the only real icons of where we are. So if we look real quick, we'll see the dotted path to Mount Moses is back this way. We'll see that the direction we're going to go to the right is to Brielle Avenue. That's actually the start of the Blue Trail. Uh, you would park at Brielle near Roanoke and walk in through there behind the Brielle nursing home. And if you were to go behind Chris, you'd go back to Rockland Avenue, you could go over Rockland and then toward the Nature Center or toward the Red Trail or the White Trail if you wanted. Uh, but we're gonna go this way because I had a hunch that not so many people come down this part of the Blue Trail. And I wore my blue mask today to commemorate the Blue Trail. <laughs> If you're one of the more seasoned green belt enthusiasts and hikers, you may be wondering why we're walking this way. Because the Blue Trail actually used to connect beyond that footpath where we were. Um, and it used to go up around closer to the Seaview building. But when the other environmental educator, Chris Rommel, and I recently this year reblazed all of the trails in the green belt, we had to look at the map and make sure that everything matched. And it turned out that this was actually supposed to be the official trail. So we came through here. And I'm really excited that this is where it is because this particular corridor is really unique to me. And I wonder if you can see how it kind of differs from other parts of the green belt. It might be kind of hard to see on the camera. But what I see are lots and lots of birch trees. So all of these here, these are white birch or paper birch. And the one that I pointed to actually has a pretty nice buck rub there on it that we'll notice as we walk through. But 
the paper birches, since they're so white, they're very conspicuous on the landscape and we can see them from really far away because that light is, the sunlight is really reflecting off of them very well. And so you may have seen lots of birch in like home decor and interior design and things like that because it's such a beautiful bark. And the bark actually, like people may come in sometimes and tear the bark off because they want to add it to craft projects or whatever, but we definitely encourage people not to take anything off of living trees or really out of the park at all. However, if a birch tree were to fall down because they only live to like 30 to 50 years, if they fall down, then the wood actually starts to decay before the bark and the bark stays in a tube. So I, as well as Angel, love paper birch for a, a variety of reasons. I think there's a lot of uh, mythology around the world related to birch trees as well. Um, in like, European Norse mythology, the birch trees were the notches to heaven, which is kind of cool because generally birch trees are like a lower lying swamp species. And so they're the first steps when you're ascending a steep terrain. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah, and I learned today also that birches are some of the first trees that will plant in um, burned areas of a landscape. But we wanted to just come over here and show you guys this really beautiful tiny cute American holly which is uh, one of the native species here. We don't see them too much throughout the green belt but when you do it's a nice surprise because they are one of the evergreens so on a starkly cold day in the winter you'll still see them showing signs of life and I find them to be especially encouraging and vibrant in these days. But today's actually super warm. I expected it to be colder like it was yesterday. And for those of you joining us or have been with us since the beginning, this is the Greenbelt at Home virtual hike in Bloodroot Valley. And feel free if you have any questions, you all see anything that's cool that you have a question or thought about as we pass, feel free to throw it into the comment section so we can respond to it. This, cool. <laughs> these canopies look really cool here over your head. Pretty cool. Yeah. So we'll see these a lot throughout the green belt. This is a very common tree. I'm just pulling out the seeds. Um, this is a beech tree, an American beech tree. And if you've taken walk walks in the green belt in the winter or late autumn, like now or early spring, and there aren't other leaves on the trees, just evergreen leaves or needles, you may still see these ones out there. And you may on a windy day, hear them rustle a very unique sound to these woods and oh, there they go That was delightful. It's like the wind heard me talking about it. That was so great. So the special thing about it, and the question you might have is, why are those leaves still on the trees when all of the sweet gums and the oak and all of their leaves have already fallen to the ground and are starting to already decompose? And there are lots of theories as to why that is. Um, one of them is potentially to protect the buds from deer brows. And another one is to protect the bark because the bark of the beech tree is quite light. So it may be protecting it from the sun's rays during the winter months. And as we walk down here, and like I mentioned, the blue trail didn't always come down this narrow corridor. It actually went up and around and connected down to where we're going to meet at the bridge at the bottom of the hill here. And 
And so part of the reason why that is, is because they wanted to kind of usher people away from the old abandoned sea view buildings. So we're going to talk about them today and you might as well know and you would have maybe seen also on the wayfinder that somebody came in and let you know that that's where those are lots of local mythology and everything about those buildings and what may go on in there today but we're going to focus on the historical context of those buildings I mean, this is one of my favorite parts of the Greenbelt because of Angel. She just mentioned that combination of human history as well as natural history. And the idea that this part of the Greenbelt has some of the most rare or isolated plant species on Staten Island. And on top of that, some rich history related to institutions that existed here. There's connections to the American Revolution and the role that Staten Island played sort of in the, the larger part of that historical war. But then you also have these really magical natural areas as well. Topographically speaking, we are in a valley now. So we just came down the hill from that portion of the Blue Trail and we're gonna now start to go up this hill. Um, naturally, water likes to flow to the bottom. And this water is actually, I believe, part of the Richmond Creek, uh, the different tributaries that lead into the larger creek that then are part of the Blue Belt and the uh, stormwater management system by the DEC and then ends up in the Fresh Kills area. So it's really, really cool that this creek kind of meanders on its own really wild pathway through Bloodroot Valley and into the Seaview buildings over into Pouch Camp as well on the other side of Manor Road. And it provides really unique habitat for aquatic species, plant species, animals here in this valley. This part of the trail is a moderate hike. There's a pretty good incline. Definitely be careful if you're out here. There are lots of roots on the trail and stones that may be a little loose. I'm going to bring you over to this natural feature that I'm sure people have seen. Maybe some people know what it is. Some people may not know what it is. Any guesses? Well, I bet my son's out there somewhere. Sachem knows what this is exactly because we had to drill it into his head because it's really important to stay away from. This is the hairy vine of the poison ivy plant. So you may be familiar with poison ivy as a three-leafed plant growing close to the ground, maybe in kind of taller shrub-like form, but then sometimes you might see it growing like pretending to be a branch of a tree and trying to trick you to let it brush against your face and give you poison ivy. Um, and that's how it gets all the way up the tree. It grows, it attaches itself with the hairs to the trunk of the tree. And it then is able to reach the sunlight that the tree is allowing it to reach. But even the hairs there contain the oils that are irritants to human skin. So be careful, don't grab it. And as I stop here, it's just really beautiful that way back the way that we came to see up 
the incline of that hill and all of the trees. It's, it's a really beautiful depiction of late autumn here with the tall grasses all batted down. And also now that most of the leaves are off the trees, it's a lot easier to see the evidence of different animal life and insects that live inside or near the trees. Like what we're showing everyone. I think it is a squirrel dry. They're usually a messy globular kind of circular formation of leaves. The squirrels create a uh, sphere of tightly packed um, twigs inside of there and then they kind of live inside of there and insulate themselves with the leaves and they put themselves in kind of like crotches or um, Y branches of trees so that they're really stable. That one's in what looks like the top of a bunch of bittersweet vines. So that's a really strong lattice work for them to stay stable on top of and that's really awesome. Deer evidence yeah. of like half the trees that I'm seeing that are about this wide or thinner have buck rub on them. I'm sure a lot of people know what a buck rub is, but for people who are not as familiar, this is an excellent example of one. I'll come to this side. So you can see, because this is a really good one, this one has a fresher rub here on this side, and this one has the scars of an older rub as well. So we know that male deer have antlers in this time of year, right? And they'll come through and their antlers actually have a fine velvety film on them that around this time of year, they start to scrape off and they're, it's itchy. And they're trying to scrape it off and using the trunk to get it off. But as they're doing that, they're leaving their scent marking there as well and letting other male deer know that this is their area and maybe you should find your own and it's also letting female deer know that this is where they are. Unfortunately, it's not the best thing for the trees. So sometimes you might see a young sapling with plastic tube around it, especially fresh tree plantings to protect them from that deer activity. So we're going to tackle this steep hill right here. So just like if you were joining us on a real hike, this section might have a little less talking. So again, if you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you to Greenbelt at Home Virtual Hike in Bloodroot Valley with Angel and Chris. And so we've talked a little bit about the natural history and human history of Bloodroot Valley, which is named after a small species of plant in the poppy family, which is more abundantly found here in this section of the green belt than anywhere else on Staten Island. 
And again, this maybe a little less visited part of the green belt became New York City property in 1994, adding to the 2,800 plus acres of land, which makes the green belt what it is today. So Chris is panning left to show you at home I hope you can see this very large structure behind me. Not this tree stump, but all the way back there. It's about to go into full sunlight. Um, you may have seen this building from the top of Mount Moses, if you were looking in this direction. You may have seen this building if you were a Boy Scout and looked over this way from Pouch Camp. You may have even seen this building if you were walking on this portion of the Blue Trail, or potentially if you were driving on Manor Road. Because what you're hearing is only a few hundred feet away some of the windier parts of Manor Road. So don't look here from the road, keep your eyes on the road, but you may have seen it through the, uh, the trees when the leaves are down. And so this particular building is, or was, the Children's Hospital portion of the old Seaview Hospital compound. And that compound was composed of 37 different buildings and underground tunnels to travel from building to building. And it was the country's premier hospital for, or sanatorium for tuberculosis patients back in the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s. And do you know when it actually closed? I'm not sure exactly when it closed. I couldn't find that information. But it's been closed for decades, for sure. It is kind of situated near the farm colony as well, which was a kind of sister compound. Um, and these buildings are all abandoned now and you cannot go inside, you can't even approach them. And if you were to see, it looks like that building's not so far away, but there's that huge ravine between us and it right now and the Richmond Creek flowing through it. But Staten Island did have this premier TB hospital and um, Staten Island is actually where the vaccine was created at the farm colony. And from what I read, it seems that the hospital was so, it was like the best in its construction because it was created with proper air ventilation and sunlight, <laughs> that's all, and sunlight and um, access to the outdoors for the patients, that those were some of the important things that were needed in the treatment for TB. That was awesome, Angel, thank you. And if anyone at home knows when the children's ward at TB was actually closed, you can throw that in the comment section. We here are always trying to learn more. And as educators, the more we can learn from people that come to our programs, the better we can get or become at teaching accurate histories. Absolutely. And we actually learned, I learned something really, really awesome yesterday about some tree carvings that I had actually previously seen. Um, so we talked about the beech tree a while back and how it's bark is really smooth and really light so lots of people will come around and carve into it and it's actually also known as the graffiti tree for that reason but i learned yesterday that there are some what people call dendroglyphs which are tree carvings in beech trees on the sea view property that are dated back to the 1930s and so joseph pentangelo who is a Staten Island folklorist and actually just won our Call to Artists contest, did a whole study on them and found that it was most likely that these dendroglyphs were carved into the trees and they show a woman in a striped dress and a sacred heart from the 1930s, probably from somebody who worked at the hospital named W. Dixon. Very interesting. 
don't encourage anybody to carve into trees because um, once you carve into it or even when the buck rubs onto a tree and breaks its bark apart, it then is very vulnerable to disease. So please don't touch the trees. Excellent leave no trace message there. As when any time we're trying to go out into the green belt, we as educators are trying to uphold leave no trace principles and we hope that all of our patrons and visitors do as well. So Angel was talking a little bit about the history of the Children's Ward and Seaview Hospital. If there are any other Staten Island historians or history buffs out there, maybe they can help us uncover some information regarding the Revolutionary War in this section of the Greenbelt. So from what I gathered, the, uh, during the American Revolution, Staten Island played a couple different roles throughout that war, and one of them involved an attack on the British, and their escape route was supposed to come as it's going towards Richmond and Old Star, where there were supposed to be vessels waiting to take them off of Staten Island to the mainland, that the resistance, right, the colonial army came through here while they were trying to escape and there's supposed to be remnants of that road somewhere in Bloodroot Valley. Angel and I do not know where that exact location is. So if any of you have any information regarding that, we would love to know about it so that we can continue to teach about Staten Island, its natural history and human history. But it would be really cool to just imagine, I know I can hear Manor Road right now, but to imagine in the 1700s being a soldier, not wearing an insulated jacket like today, but having a musket, having maybe some heavy wool clothing, and kind of running through this section of the Greenbelt with the British in hot pursuit. We can see the ravine a little bit better now that mm -hmm. Angel was mentioning before. And there is a fence between us and the creek on this part because that is private property over there. But even just walking on this trail and then um, you can continue from where we are straight down the marked path to the left. You hang a left on the blue trail and it shows you some of the other buildings involved in the Seaview Hospital compound. And like I said, there were 37 of them and this is just one of them. Definitely the biggest one though. Um, and it is a really important part of Staten Island history. History of the Green Belt. The Green Belt had Seaview, the Farm Colony, and the Willowbrook School. So all of those are defunct with a story to tell. So if you wanted to do some of your own research, the information is out there and it's really important to understand the history of our landscape and our space to understand how we got here and then where we want to go from here, right? Do we want to go backwards? Do we want to go forwards? I think forward is the way for sure. Very cool. So we talked about the Revolutionary War. We talked about the hospitals that existed here. What made this ravine? Right, that's another really important right, part. Let's go, let's go right. further right. back. Like, how, like you want to go... Let's go back to the back. beginning. Oh, okay, the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, not the very beginning, but uh, about 10,000 years ago, the Wisconsin Glacier, I think I'm writing this in like, the Wisconsin Glacier that covered all of this land and everything north of us, um, actually stopped at the southernmost tip of Staten Island at Conference House Park, which is pretty amazing to think about. I remember when I learned that nugget of information, um, it just never left my mind because I think it's, it's just very interesting that this place holds that historical um, importance as well. But so as a glacier retreats, it may pull things along with it, like stones, 
carving different pieces of our landscape as we see it today. Um, it may drop chunks of ice that end up melting and turning into natural kettle ponds. May even drop pieces of stones, huge glacial erratics that are not native stones to this area, um, but were brought here from elsewhere. And that may not have exactly happened here because we were the end point, but you get the idea. Uh, we have a glacial erratic in High Rock Park. There is another one along this trail here, but that is where the Greenbelt and Staten Island and its many hills and its bedrock kind of got its face that we know today. So as we walk around High Rock Park up from Lustrak Swamp, we know that that has a very storied history from back when the glacier was here as well. And we can see it in these hills today. Awesome. Thank you for that amazing science and geological history. You're cool. welcome. <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap it up. So I want to thank you all for joining us yet again for our Greenbelt at Home virtual hike. If you're interested in more Greenbelt at Home virtual content, you can visit our, visit our events page at sigreenbelt.org or you can look us up on YouTube at the Staten Island Greenbelt. We hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Have a great day.